But here's a case in point. It came full circle to me as I sat with Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, talking about how he would select his victims. As we talked, Ramirez was quick to say things like, hey, I'm not a serial killer, but if I were, and based on what I've read, many of them are doing it all wrong. And then Ramirez would go on to theorize how a predator could select victims in a perfect way, <laughs> which just happened to be the same strategy that he was using over and again. Well, hey folks, is the BTK killer finally found religion? Keep in mind that Dennis Rader was serving as a lay clergyman when he was arrested for murdering 10 people back in 2005. Now, Rex Shearman, he's starting to get religion. So my question about Rader, BTK, is this narcissist finally proving once and for all that he's still only concerned about one thing, and that's Dennis Rader. Stick around in this video on why I believe he's getting exactly what he wants and all of us are feeding into it. Hey, well, thanks for tuning into Profiling Evil in this episode on the re-emergence of the BTK story. Now, I've purposely been staying away from this one over the last couple of years. I actually have all of the crime scene photos and much of the information, including his letters, BTK's letters that I've just kept quietly in the background, not wanting to share publicly. But now with his daughter coming out and all the attention he's getting on the media, I wanted to just share a couple of thoughts that I had. Now, I believe all of this is happening because we're reading the news about Gilgo Beach accused killer Rex Heerman reportedly discovering religion. That's right. The New York Post recently reported that heerman has been meeting with clergy as he sits in jail. Now, frankly, I don't think it's that bizarre that he's meeting with clergy, but it really makes me want to know whether this guy had church activity in his life during the time that he, if in fact is the Long Island killer, that he was making and killing those uh, people back then. And more importantly, what was he doing over the last 10 years? Was this guy going to church every Sunday? I hope that kind of information gets explained somewhere down the road. Now listen, folks, please take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so that you get all of our notifications on videos just like this one. And please consider sharing Profiling Evil with your friends. Now, right after Rex Heerman was arrested, convicted serial killer Dennis Rader, best known as the name BTK, bind him, torture him, kill him, started telling the world that he and Rex seem very similar to each other. Now, this serial predator claims that Heerman is a clone of him, Dennis Rader, because he bound and tortured his victims before he killed them. Well, many serial killers bound or bind and torture their victims. So my question is, in Heerman's case, is that really true? Has there been any evidence that's come out that supports that the Gilgo Four were bound and tortured before they were killed? I can't think of anything that has been shown to, to prove or support that. Now, we can clearly infer that that might be the case. But again, I haven't heard of any forensic evidence, photographs, anything that supports Raiders' claims that Heerman was doing those same things. But here are a few things that are similar. Both suspects were arrested at close to the same age. Now, Raider wrote a letter to Fox Digital News explaining that the two were, in his opinion, clones. He said, we were husbands at the, at the time of our crimes and of our arrests. Well, many serial killers are husbands at the time of their crimes and arrests. He said, we were fathers and eerily we had the same number of children. Many serial killers have been fathers, some with children in the home at the time that they did them. Uh, now, he said uh, other things that he tried to make seem like they were the same. And if... If Heerman was responsible for the Gilgo Four, 
or for more people, the the other Long Island serial killer cases, um, he and and uh, Raider could actually claim that yes, they were living in plain sight, undetected, or at least they felt like they were undetected. And although his lack of technical forensic understanding got Raider eventually arrested, if you remember that, he sent a note to the police saying, hey, tell me the truth. Can you track my computer if I put something on a floppy disk? And police said, hey, go ahead and do it. Of course, that's what led to his arrest. Um, but Raider says they both were stalkers who used electronic devices as part of their modus operandi. Now, BTK tormented his victim families and police with his letter writing campaigns and other theatrics. You know, I've been teaching about BTK for decades. I first learned of the case through my mentor, FBI profiler Greg Cooper. And I'll tell you, I want to always shout out Greg's goodness in teaching me this art and science of profiling. Over the decades, I also had the opportunity to learn from other amazing profilers like Mark Safarik. He's been on my show many times and John Douglas. I was also tutored by experts, everybody from going back to, to uh, working with Ann, Dr. Ann Burgess to today being able to associate and work alongside people like Dr. Judy Ho. But most importantly, I was instructed by many of the actual serial killers that are still talked about today. And I mean it, instructed by them. I've literally spent hundreds of hours in the prison system. And during those investigations and through those interviews with them, I learned from them. Now, it seems kind of weird to say that I learned something from killers like ritual murderer Dan Lafferty or Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. But like I've told many investigators as I've taught around the world, those predators are truly the experts. We are merely apprentices. Well, enough about my past. Let's focus on why BTK has suddenly put himself in the limelight again. I mean, it's been 17 years since his arrest and conviction. And in that time, this guy has become less and less relevant in the public eye. Now that, in my opinion, has been devastating to his ego. He's no longer in control but now he's agreeing to speak with law enforcement. He's writing letters to the media and he's speaking with reporters, which gives him something he desperately lacked. Gives him a little bit of power and control. That's something that was taken from him as he sat in the prison. And I'll say it again, he desperately seeks it. Now, most experts will agree that there are a few reasons why these narcissistic predators talk with police long after their conviction. There's no secret to the fact that narcissists lack the ability to care about others, especially about their victims or the victim's extended family members. And certainly they don't care about the good of society in general. That, in part, is what I find so interesting about these claims that they're finding religion in prison. To me, the real test and hopefully it's one that will never be exercised, is what would that predator do if they were released back into society? Because we see so many examples where predators gain early release and simply go on to commit other violent felonies. Now, the predator might act like they care, but I really believe that there are selfish reasons behind everything that they do. And I want to explore a few of those. But first... Let's talk about whether or not they are truly repentant, remorseful. Remember, these are people who are experts at deceiving others and convincing even those people who are closest to them that they are something that they're not. I hope you'll go back and watch some of my videos on the three personas in people's lives. I think you might find that it's really interesting as you continue to explore these new series of events that are rolling out in cases like this one. But in short, we all have these public, private, and secret personas. The public life is that persona in which we put in front of people in an attempt to impress them or manipulate them. Our private persona, though, is a little better indication of who we really are. And I often use this example of hand washing after using the restroom. Now, if, if hand washing is really the right thing to do, we should do it all the time, right? 
I mean, think of your own personality. And please, don't fill the chat below with your comments on this one, unless you really want to. But most people are really good at washing their hands after using the restroom in a public setting, as long as others are seeing them do so. The real question is, what do those people, including us, do in the privacy of our own home? Do they even wash their hands in the privacy of their own home? That, that really is this private persona. Now, the private persona is that place where every once in a while, a little bit of your ugly side pops out. Usually when it does, you quickly try to correct it. You apologize for your behavior and you try to become better. But it's our secret side where that Tasmanian devil lives for most of us. It's, and, and for most of us, when these terrible thoughts come into our mind, we symbolically slap them down and push them back into the hidden recesses of our psyche. And then we try to fill that void with redeeming kinds of thoughts. Now, serial predators, on the other hand, allow this secret side to become part of who they are. It fuels their fantasy, and then it becomes their reality. It's really the secret side that's most revealing, and sadly, it's often only witnessed by the victim. And rarely does that victim live, in the case of serial killers, to talk about it. Now, if you'd like to learn more about these concepts, go over to our Profiling Evil content page and look up those videos. And frankly, while I'm on the topic, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for the Profiling Evil Academy. It's a place where you can learn more about this and other investigative principles. And I think the Academy, especially the Academy Channel membership, is a great place to learn and frankly provide us with a little bit of financial support, which we really appreciate. Now, serial predators might offer insight to help gain the adulation of others. In essence, to get family or the public or more importantly, people of power like judicial officers, court officers, corrections officers, people who have influence over their current circumstance to find favor with them. When Raider started sharing information publicly, in my opinion, I thought he's trying to get either additional attention, something for nothing or for giving up the information, flattery, or some form of wacky adoration. Now, being or simply care, uh, being or appearing like you care about people might elicit a thank you or a special acknowledgement. This type of motivation, though, in a serial predator is driven by a need for validation. And I think it needs to be considered in Dennis Rader, BTK's situation, but not in a good way, folks. I think, I think Dennis Rader is more interested in remaining at the top of the serial killer food chain than in help, helping out. The best of the best is what he wants to be. And, and that brings me to the next reason why these predators reach out and offer information. And that's the need for additional fame. And as we talk about this need for fame, keep in mind that these narcissistic predators don't care about how other people feel. These aren't nice people who are doing nice things. They are manipulating criminals who are finding other ways of maintaining control. And let me be clear, this is my personal opinion. I don't believe that they care about others uh, or the problems that they might even be acting like they care about addressing. Their care is not good. And frankly, it might actually be harmful. But here's a case in point. It came full circle to me as I sat with Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, talking about how he would select his victims. As we talked, Ramirez was quick to say things like, hey, I'm not a serial killer, but if I were... And based on what I've read, many of them are doing it all wrong. And then Ramirez would go on to theorize how a predator could select victims in a perfect way, <laughs> which just happened to be the same strategy that he was using over and again. Now, a predator like Dennis Rader coming forward and comparing Rex Herman, who's currently getting all the serial killer headlines, is nothing more than Rader wanting to reassess and reaccess that notion 
that he's better at being bad than Herman or any other serial killer out there. If Raider can somehow regenerate his own fame and boost his own narcissistic public image, he's in a controlling and winning position. And, and he's the only one who's interested in that. He's only interested in his own status and the bonus points he might be getting by the public thinking he's somehow repentant or generous in giving up more information. Now, to me, the real test of someone who's in BTK shoes, for instance, someone who's perhaps trying to show that they're repentant and changed, would be if that same predator who was trying to restitute for the bad deeds they committed, that they privately, and let me say this again, that they privately reach out to law enforcement to give more information on additional victims trying to bring closure to families or to offer help on ongoing investigations. But no, no, instead, what we see happening is exactly what Raider's doing, sending letters to the media, ensuring his name ends up in the paper. And in reality, I guess it's working because we're all buying into that and we're all talking about it, it me included, folks. Well, predators like Dennis Rader or Rex Herman might appear confident, but in my opinion, their actual sense of worth and self-esteem is all just a facade. It's only conditional. And our response feeds into that ego that they're trying to satisfy when we put so much attention on it. Now, one of the common ways these predators try to manage their shaky sense of self-esteem is by comparing themselves to each other and convincing themselves and us along the way that they are better at being bad <laughs> while they attempt to show how good they are. I mean, it is a crazy situation. Now, in this social media world that we live in, narcissism is alive and well in social media and in YouTube. I'm constantly trying to self-evaluate where I am. Am I providing something of value through profiling evil? Or am I somehow feeding my own ego in a destructive, self-serving way. I really hope that I have the confidence to say goodbye to all of you. If I ever reach the point that I think subscriber counts or content views are more important than taking the high road. Now, I appreciate the money we make off of ad revenue. And I really appreciate what you provide us through your donations. And I hope you've seen over the years that we push that back. Thankfully, I've got a great job. I've got an income, I've got a retirement, uh, and, and we're able to do things like bury people for families that can't afford to pay for the burial, or step up and provide training for police officers, or donate toward the building of a children's justice center like we've been involved in. But I hope you'll all keep me on these uh, honesty checks along the way. But let's, let's finish here. Again, a predator might come forward like Dennis Rader has done to improve his own status inside the prison or even on social media outside the prison. Prisons are terribly tough places and as Raider ages beyond his 75 years, he is rapidly becoming more and more vulnerable and less and less important. His ability to keep others in his debt is expiring faster than his, his uh, days are. And as he loses his position, his ego is incredibly damaged. Now that may in fact be part of the punishment that is so difficult for him to deal with right now. I mean, his connections are minimized and his influence is becoming non-existent. And so when he does things like we're seeing right now, it's not surprising at all. In short, Dennis Rader, BTK, is being forgotten but the damage that this guy caused to the Wichita, Kansas community and perhaps surrounding states and maybe even further is going to last for generations. Now, I don't know if any of you are thinking that Dennis Rader, BTK, is helping or caring, but I want to reaffirm my personal belief that he is not doing so. He is a pretender. He is a pathetic individual who lacks empathy. He's lost his feeling of superiority. His need for power and control is unsatisfied. And any other predator who's gaining public attention for serial murder is a threat 
to this guy's core ego. Like each of us, the only thing we're going to be able to leave behind is our legacy. His legacy is going to be one of horror. And I hope that ours is an antithesis of what he desires. Now, I want to dedicate my comments on News Nation yesterday to my buddy, Lieutenant Kenny Landwehr of the Wichita Police Department. Kenny was one of the first police officers on the scene of the BTK murders, and he investigated that his entire career. We remained friends for decades as we talked about the investigation and we talked about BTK as an individual. I shared with him what my sense of BTK was, the profile. We taught criminal courses together across the country and we talked on a regular basis. In fact, Kenny would actually call into my university classes when I was teaching criminal profiling and he would share his thoughts on the BTK case. Now, before I show this clip from News Nation, I wanted to play a short clip of Kenny talking about whether BTK is alive or dead. Now, this training and this video happened three years before Dennis Rader was arrested for murder, and Kenny was there. Uh, I tell you, I, I really love and miss Kenny and our conversations. And so, again, let's dedicate this to Kenny Landwer. Because something catastrophic had to happen to him. He either moved, he either mentally became unbalanced, he physically became unbalanced, or he went to jail. Something happened because that kind of work doesn't stop. We have had unsolved homicides since then that could be linked to BTK. I'm not saying we don't. We have no physical evidence that we can tie that way. We have several females that were tied up. We have several females that have been abandoned out in the field somewhere that could definitely fit his MO uh, with bondage and that sort of thing. We have had no communique that we know of from BTK. Uh, claiming any more kills, uh, but I'm not saying that he isn't there. Now remember, narcissists are motivated by feelings of superiority, power, control. If they're communicating publicly, it's not for any altruistic reason. Now let's watch my comments on News Nation, where I'm pretty blunt about a couple of things. Let's watch. Joining us now to talk more about these latest investigations, former investigator Mike King, who is also the host of Profiling Evil podcast and YouTube show. Mike, thank you so much for your time. We just heard from the sheriff there. How pivotal, how pivotal could these recently recovered items be? And also keeping in mind that there's been so much time that's passed. I mean, could that potentially impact the evidence? Yeah, I, th I think that's going to be a real challenge to see what forensically can be collected on this evidence, if anything at all, frankly, after this much time, or if there might be other identifying marks that are found on the pieces of evidence that can be tied back to specific victims. Now, the thing that's so important about this, frankly, find, if in fact it truly is a ligature as the as the sheriff has described it, rather than something that was just uh, tied up and knotted up and junk in the backyard, is that we know that BTK was into bondage and had a, a rape kit that he carried with him, a kit to make it successful for him to be able to gain control of his victims and maintain control. But it also fit his psyche of the things that were exciting to him as part of all of his homicidal events. And so all of that's going to just become one more piece of the puzzle that it's going to be necessary to tie back and forth. And and frankly, I, I, there's so little evidence or information coming out right now. It's really hard to say, is it part of the 10 right. or is it a new victim? You know, and Mike, are you surprised these other potential cases are just now being linked to Raider? I mean, and does that mean that there could be even more linked to him and they just have yet to be announced? Oh, I think certainly there could be uh, possibly more cases that end up being tied to uh, Raider. No, no, number one, it's really important to recognize the fact that a serial predator goes through this buildup process, they act out, and then they go through a cooling off period and they start fantasizing and get ready to go again. They don't just turn off the switch. And we see Raider in this particular series of 10 turning off the switch and going in, uh, decades without being captured. I knew the investigator in this case very well, the guy who was there on the first day of the Otero murders and the day that Raider was arrested. We've talked so much about the case and about the behaviors involved in the case. It's just unlikely that he would just turn it off 
without having some kind of substitute or something happening along the way. So it's going to be really valuable yeah. to see his locations and the events that, that bring people together. Yeah, that buildup is, is so key, as you said, about 30 seconds. But do you think at this point in his life uh, he, he would, would or could reveal anything more? Yeah, I think that's really the key. The thing that brought BTK back into the picture, in my opinion, was that there was a serial truck driver in the area of Wichita. People were opining that he might be BTK, and then BTK started reaching out to police again. I don't think his ego will let him stand by with people like Hurman and others being out in the front of the news. This is a great way for him to get it back out in front. And frankly, it gives him what he's always wanted, power and control. Yeah, we will see what happens. Mike King, thank you so much for giving us some it's of your pleasure. time. Well, what are your thoughts on this video, folks? I hope you'll put your comments down below, and I hope that you'll be kind to one another as you respond to their comments. These criminal cases are terribly difficult to talk about, so I hope that you'll take time to uh, be kind in your comments. Hey, and hey, I hope you're taking time to watch other videos of things that are a whole lot more uplifting than the true crime genre. Now I know I try to, and I'm gonna to continue to try to put out videos that are less sensational, but more instructional. Hopefully, they'll help all of us to remember that there are ways in which we can minimize our risk of being victims. Now in the BTK case, there was little that the victims of Dennis Rader could have done to avoid his homicidal fantasies. But as so many other true crime cases show, there are things that we can do that will help us reduce our risk levels. Take some time, folks, to watch my videos on risk reduction. Hey, you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course here on YouTube. And make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you like audio podcasts, I hope you're checking out Profiling Evil podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. Now the summer's winding down, so I hope you're taking time to go out with your family and friends and get out and breathe some fresh air. I'm taking grandkids to the cabin for the weekend, and I hope to do nothing but laugh and maybe paddle around in the canoe for a bit. We'll see you soon, folks, at the next crime scene.